at start class. Today's class is the last class of this subject in this semester. And what I want to do, what I'm going to do in this class is using the previous crystallographic uh, basis, I'd like to analysis, I would like to analyze the Martin side transformation using the phenomenological theory of the Martin side transformation. And the basic theory, you all, all you already learned about the basic theory and manipulation and the terminology on the crystallography. So what we are going to do in this class is a kind of mathematical manipulation. To remind the core concept of the Martin side transformation, let's start with this slide. So I told you that the lattice strain which convert FCC into VCC is invariant line strain, right? Which is the combination of band deformation and raised body rotation. But what we observe in experiment, the shape deformation associated with uh, FCC to BCC is invariant plane strain because we can observe the heavy plane, which seems to be invariant before and after the transformation. So to fill the gap, what we observe and what theory tell you, we have to introduce secondary lattice invariant strain to reconcile what you observe in the experiment and what they will tell you. So here is our initial austenite. And by applying the vein deformation and wrist body rotation, you can convert the lattice structure of the FCC into BCC. But the shape of bot central cubic is not what you observe during the experiment. What you observe during the experiment is here, just deformed by invariant plane strain. So to make the wrong shape into the observed shape, we introduce the lattice invariant shear, which change the shape, but do not have any influence on the crystal structure, such as slip or twin. So when we write down what I said in previous slide into the matrix form, it will be like this one, right? So here, this is lattice transformation strain, which is invariant line strain, which convert FCC into BCC. So as you know, this lattice transformation strain consists of vein strain and wrist body rotation. As I told you, invariant, that is invariant line strain. Invariant line strain can be factorized into two invariant plane strain, right? And when we take one of invariant plane strain as a shape's deformation, what we observe, what we observe during the experiment, shape deformation. Shape deformation means that this is our initial austenite. Okay. 
This is what we observed. So the deformation associated with this one, what we observe is shape deformation. So when we take one of the invariant plane strain as a shape deformation, we can factorize the invariant line strain with two successive invariant plane strain. So from now on, I'd like to write down the shape deformation. On the shape deformation, the direction of the displacement and D and the plane normal as a P. Actually, this is not the correct form, but for the simplicity. And the secondly, invariant plane strain, the direction is E and the plane normal of the invariant plane as a Q. Then from the, pre pre uh, the discussion in the previous class, we can define the invariant line U as an intersection of two invariant plane and the invariant normal of the plane contain the invariant normal uh, plane uh, have invariant normal H contains the E and Q, right? Two displacement vector contains the displacement vector consists construct the invariant plane normal. So that is what I said in the previous class. This one? FQF. Yeah. yeah, this is a secondary invariant plane strain in this slide. Here, Q, P, P, P2, the deformation correspond P2. Will be represented by the deformation matrix Q. Here? Yeah. The shape deformation is the deformation what we observe. In previous figure, the P1, P1 is shape deformation. P2, P2 actually, inverse of P2 is lattice invariant deformation. Inverse of P2. No? So actually, the lattice deformation, which change FCC to VCC is invariant line strain, and this is represented by the combination of band deformation and rigid body rotation. And that is also factorized, can be factorized in two serial invariant plane strain. One is a shape deformation, what we observe, and the other is inverse of lattice invariant shear, which convert the wrong shape into the right shape.
The reason why I want to factorize the invariant line strain into two invariant line strain into this two invariant plane strain. Maybe there are many ways to factorize. I'm not sure. But what I want to do is to know the shape deformation. Because what we observe, what we can observe during the experiment is the heavy plane. So actually, at first we do not know about what kind of slip system will operate in to give proper shape, to give proper shape which what we observed during the experiment. So to compare the phenomenological theory and experiment, the key link is shape deformation. Shape deformation can be observed and can be calculated. So we can compare our, whether our theory is right or wrong. So actually, by selecting proper slip system for the lattice invariant shear, we can calculate the shape deformation. I will show in a later slide. And we can compare the heavy plane calculated by theory and what you observe in experiment, we can say our theory is wrong or right, and we can choose proper slip system, which give right answer. So if you know the slip system, you can Sorry? If you know the slip system, so you know the Q. Yeah. yeah. If we know the slip system, which give invariant, uh, lattice invariant shear, because as I told you, lattice invariant shear is governed by twinning or slip. So if we know the slip system, for example, this case, if we know the slip system, we can say the amount of PQ. The, the not the amount of the the we we can just describe the the deformation matrix which correspond to p uh, p two q p two q. So everyone is okay. Not okay. So at first we know the Bain's train because when we fix the system, we know the lattice parameter of FPCC and lattice parameter of BCC, right? That lattice parameter value give you a deformation matrix of Bain deformation, right? It, o it only the deformation matrix of Venn deformation depends only the ratio of the lattice parameter. So we know this one. And with the assumption on the slip system, we can evaluate matrix Q, right? And what I want to do is at first to find with by the rotation and then from this, this, this three matrix automatically, we can have the deformation matrix on the shape deformation. The procedure is just mathematical manipulation. 
So this is procedure. Here, our matrix form of Martensite transformation. And we know the deformation matrix associated with the vein deformation. If the system is fixed, alloy system is fixed, right? And at first, we have to assume what kind of slip system will operate. So assumption on Q is a slip plane Q and direction E. Because Q is simple sure, slip plane Q will be slip plane. And the direction E will be slip direction, OK? And also, Q and E should be unit vector. And Q and E should be perpendicular to each other because Q is a simple shear, right? At first, with this information, I would like to find out Invariant line U and invariant plane normal H U and H with a condition. U should be on plane Q, right? And plane H, the plane defined by the plane normal H contains the E. from U is belong to Q, and the plane defined by plane normal H contains E, right? And also, the U and H is a unit vector. And one more condition here. This invariant, invariant, line and invariant normal, it just rotate by vein deformation. The length does not change, right? The length is not changed by vein deformation. Just, they just rotate. With these three conditions, we can find the invariant line U and invariant plane normal H. And then we can evaluate the rotation matrix. I will show you. OK. Let's start some assumption on the slip plane. We can choose many. We can have a variety of options to choose the slip system, actually slip plane and slip direction. Slip plane means the invariant plane. And slip direction is the direction of displacement by the invariant plane strain, right? So in, in the case of, in this case, simple shear, direction of simple shear. So we have many choice on the selection of the slip plane and slip direction. So that is a kind of trial and error. So at first, we choose some slip system and calculate all the, uh, all the uh, doing. And, and at first, we choose the slip system and calculate the shape deformation, which give you the information on the heavy plane, so matches with the calculated result and observed one, when it do not match each other, we may have we may choose the wrong slip system. But the selection of slip system is not that diverse. So it does not it may not take a long repeated Try and error. Anyway, 
if we have the right slip system, it will give proper, it will give the right habit plane which is observed during uh, the experiment. And there are many reports on which alloy system, in, 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 in certain alloy system which uh, slip <coughs> system is operating for the lattice embedded shear and in other alloy system, other, other things. And there are many, many reports. Anyway, starting with the 101 plane as slip plane and 101 bar as slip direction in austenite phase. So when you assume this slip system, it automatically gives you the plane normal of invariant plane strain and the displacement direction of that deformation, simple sure. <coughs> so when we put, when you assume the invariant line vector as U1, U2, U3, on FCC base. That vector belong to plane Q, right? So you have this relationship, one. And second one is U is, the U is unit vector. So you have the second condition. There are three unknown to three, so we need one more condition. That is <clears throat> the vector u, the vector u just rotated by the vein deformation. The length does not change. Okay? So, Let's think that the vector u is rotated by vein deformation and it becomes vector x. The length of vector x is given by this one. Here, f is an orthonormal basis. Orthonormal basis and three axes is perpendicular to each other and the length of base vector is unit. So in that case, its reciprocal lattice is the same to the original base, right? So we can write down this one. And here, this is the transverse of the B, but you know that the vein deformation matrix, there is no off diagonal term. So it's trans transpose is the same to the original one, right? Because there are no off diagonal terms. So just write down, and this is the square of the band formation matrix. So from this condition, the length should be the same. We can have the third relationship. So when we fix the low system, we will have some value of eta one, eta two, and eta three, which is associated with the ratio of the lattice parameter. So with this value, we can have, we can get the vector u, index of vector u. Actually, when you do the calculation, you will have two solutions because we are two options, this, this direction and this direction, right? So actually you have two solutions. And we can do the similar thing to identify the index of invariant normal here When we assume that 
invariant plane normal H as H1, H2, H3. This plane should contain the displacement vector, right? So we have this relationship. And also the magnitude of the plane normal should be unit. So we have the second condition. <laughs> Finally, the invariant normal defined by band deformation, the length of that invariant normal does not change. So if H is deformed by L, by the vein deformation, the magnitude of L is given by this one here. Again, the reciprocal lattice and the original lattice the same, so we can write down here. And this is the inverse of vein deformation. This is the transpose of the inverse. But actually, two vector is the same. Transpose and its original is the same. So you can get this third relationship. So with some proper value, when you define the Lois system, you can get two vectors on invariant plane normal. So you have two invariant, invariant line and two invariant normal. So there are four combinations. So just select one. So we have H and U, and by applying the phase deformation, we can get the direction X and the invariant plane normal L after the vein deformation. In cubic system, in the orthogonal system, if you define two axes, you automatically define the third axis, which is perpendicular to the previous two axes. So similarly, we can get the third axis by the cross product of vector U and H, and the cross product of vector X and L, you can get the B. Now, we have three vectors before vein deformation and after the vein deformation. What link? What kind of deformation? What kind of matrix link with these two bases? Rotation matrix, right? So if we apply the rotation matrix in X, L, B, it, will, it should give U, H, A, right? So this is X, this is U, and when we rotate, X should give vector U, right? Mm. It is just matrix calculation. So it is not that difficult to obtain the rotation matrix here, right? So far, so good. Now, we have rotation matrix, vein deformation matrix, and that is invariant shear. So it automatically gives you the matrix on the shape deformation. Now you, we can compare our calculation with experimental observation. The shape deformation matrix all can give you the information on the uh, heavy plane and the displacement by the 
shape deformation. And let's see how we can calculate the heavy plane from the shape deformation. Here, from these two band deformation and rigid body rotation, we can calculate the transformation strain, which give you, which permit you to convert FCC to BCC, right? And this is a combination of these two serial process of lattice uh, the, 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 the plane strain, uh, invariant plane deformation, right? So this is the lattice transformation strain, and this is two successive plane strain, invariant plane strain. And now we know all the value of P and Q and S. So take inverse, and this give you this kind of N, and this is the matrix form of invariant plane strain, right? Here is M and N and M is the magnitude of the displacement, and A is the inverse of determinant P. Here, the inverse of determinant Q is one because that Q is a simple shear. So there is no volume change. So the determinant itself is one unit. So that's why we not put any, just, just here is one, right? So by applying the plane normal Q on both sides of the previous equation with some manipulation. It looks complicated, but it is not that complicated because here Q and E is perpendicular to each other, so this is zero, right? So with some manipulation, finally you can have this form. Here, P is index of heavy plane, right? Now we have index of heavy plane because we know Q, Q, and lattice transformation matrix. So when you apply the previous numbers, the index of heavy plane given by this plane normal vector. So as you, as you can see, it is irrational, not the slip plane or just not the rational plane. Right? So we can compare the calculation and what we observe. Similarly, we can calculate the displacement vector by applying the displacement vector E on both sides of this, this uh, matrix relationship. And finally, I would like to mention about the orientation relationship between the uh, Austinite and Martinsite. I told you which matrix described the orientation relationship between two lattices. I already told you, right? I told you many matrix deformation matrix, coordinate transformation matrix, correspondence matrix, blah, blah, blah. Among them, which matrix describe the orientation relationship between two crystal? Right, 
it is difficult to remember everything, right? The coordinate transformation matrix will give you the relationship, orientation relationship, describe the orientation relationship between two crystals, right? Here, this is coordinate transformation matrix and combination of deformation matrix and coordinate coordination transformation matrix give you the correspondence matrix. Right. So now we have this deformation matrix. And what is correspond matrix between FCC and BCC is given by this one. So from these two matrix, it is easy to obtain the coordinate transformation matrix between FCC, Austinite, and Martensite. Right? It's just simple manipulation. Here is the coordinate transformation matrix, which convert in one direction in FCC. How it can be described in BCC base, right? So when you put, for example, one on one, this is plane, but in cubic system, it can be regarded as a direction, right? So when we put one on one, it will give this value. When you look at this number, one on one direction in FCC is very close to one zero one one in BCC, right? But not exactly. Similarly, when we put one bar zero one, it will give you one bar, one bar, one. But not exactly matched. So this indicate that when you consider the orientation relationship between Austinite and Martensite, the orientation relationship is close to Kuzmov socks but not exactly match, which I told you one of the problem we have to solve to understand the Martensite transformation. The orientation relationship between Austinite and Martensite is irrational. It's close to certain orientation relationship like kuzumov sachs or nishama Barsaman, but not exactly match. The phenomenological theory perfectly explained why it happened. Okay. I hope this is the last slide I prepared today. Any questions?